Schomburg. Uh, I am joining you from Hannah, the proud home of Nick and Connie Planner McDonald. Um, I am a Flames fan and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> um, I'm joining you from Prairie Land School Division, which is a teensy tiny little school division in the kind of East Central Bend province. Um, I'm a literacies coordinator here at the school division, which means that I talk literacy K to 12 as well as technology. And I'm super excited to be joined by Justine. Good morning, Justine. Good morning. Well, here I am actually in Brampton, Ontario, Canada. Um, so it's actually noon for me. But good morning, all of you. I'm actually um, an assistive technology resource teacher with Peel District School Board for K to 12. So I'm really excited to be here with Bailey because she's awesome and excited to always learn something new. Perfect. Would I just like to acknowledge that I am joining you from Treaty 7, just at the very edge of Treaty 7. Um, and I respectfully acknowledge that the place that I work, learn, and play is located on the traditional traveling routes, the traditional gathering grounds, and the meeting grounds of many diverse Indigenous people, including the Metis, and we're a part of Region 3 here. Um, the Siksika Tatsapi, which is comprised of the Siksika, the Kainai, the Pakani, and the Amaskapi Pekani First Nations, uh, the Tsutina First Nation, and the Yahi and Nakoda, which includes the Chikini, the Bear's Paw, and the Gustoni First Nations, and as well as the Eskimo Nunagat. These histories, languages, cultures, and traditions influence our vibrant community here in Prairie Land and across Canada, and I am so grateful to be influenced by that long, long history that we hold in this land. Um, I'm grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and the elders that share with us today, who shared with us in the past, um, and recognize the land as an integral part of my way of life and as an act of reconciliation regret it. and i would invite you to take some time to recognize your own line in this moment we have this really cool graphic of um the tra traditional land um across north america if you've never seen it before native dash land CA is a very um interesting kind of little journey to dig into um, I am excited to be joining you with Logics today. Logics Academy um, does all sorts of awesome stuff like teacher trainings, but we also do lots of student facing things like cool robot classes. And we support a ton of awesome initiatives in education. Um, we're a Microsoft global training partner, we're a Google Cloud partner, we're a Minecraft partner, which I love. <laughs> training some Minecraft as well, also an Apple professional learning. So we do a lot of things, which is exciting. <laughs> um, and we're also excited to be here with you today for your professional learning day. So we have to thank Google for Education for funding time together. And we also have to thank these for coordinating all of our work together um, today. We would not be here without those two things. All right. Here is what I have planned for us today. Um, I, uh, I did make this plan sort of from the understanding that we would be beginning users of Google Classroom, but I also am well aware that it's likely that we're not beginning users. Um, so if this is something that is sort of well below your skill level, um, I know that there's four other sessions going on this morning and you're more than welcome to choose one of those sessions if you think that this wouldn't be a good use of your hour. I promise I won't have my feelings hurt. Um, but I am looking at this sort of from the lens of maybe you have classrooms set up and you have some pain points that you're like, I just don't really know. Um, or maybe you set up a classroom and we're like, well, I'm not ready to dive in and have kids in here yet. So um, looking at it from a few different realms, and I hope that we can find um, some learning together in these seven points that I'd like to talk about. Um, I am really curious to know who you are. So if you wouldn't mind putting in um, the chat where you're at with Google Classroom. Are you a beginner, paper airplane style? Are you like the Wright brothers flying that airplane that looked improbable? excuse me are you like fighter jet level you know with the like mask and the <laughs> and the microphone are you like rocket space elon musk level of google classroom user um please let me know in the chat i'd also love to know your assignment 
um, just so that I know kind of what examples to give. So I know Anne-Marie teaches grade one, and I know that Rebecca is Div 4 at the Argyle Center. Um, so I'm curious to hear from you where, where you're at this year. Thanks, Stanley, for letting us know. Oh, Adolfi, thank you. <laughs> oh, student teacher, congratulations on your final practicum. Oh, nice. We've got a fighter pilot among us. Oh, Lee. Seven thank you. <laughs> Was that it, Afe? You're welcome. <laughs> that was me. Sorry about that. I'm just trying no, to set up here. That's why I'm not uh, a problem. And the video and everything. I'm trying to yeah, set everything up. Sorry about Perfect. that. Perfect. Oh, an EA, exciting. So you probably used Classroom a lot with students, but you're um, kind of wondering what in the world is going on in the background, maybe. So that, that just gives time for one or two more to come in and then continue. Or maybe no more. <laughs> Play somebody's frantically typing right. <clears throat> All right, while well, that last person is frantically typing, um, the best way to get to Google Classroom is to just type classroom.google.com. And today, I really would like you to have a classroom opened um, or a practice classroom because we're going to be spending some time um, tootling around. Um, so if you have a classroom built already, I would really recommend you building a um a test classroom as well <clears throat> so i am just going to get my other screen shared here and then it's going to be a bit of bouncing between screens so we'll, we'll be able to manage <clears throat> so we are at classroom we can just type up in here, classroom.google.com, or all of our Google tools actually live underneath this waffle right here. And classroom, I have up at the very top because it's a daily for me when I'm working with students. But yours might be a little farther down. You might have to scroll. And if you're likely using classroom often, you can click and drag these and reorganize where you want them to be. Um, so I like to have my Gmail, Classroom, and Calendar up the top because those are the ones I use often. And then when I click on that waffle beside my pretty face, I get to see all of my apps. So there's a little insider tip for you. I'm just going to click on Classroom, and it's going to take us to Google Classroom. We are going to build a demo class today, a test class. So if you click on this plus button, this is how you make a new classroom. And I would like everybody to try to make a sandbox classroom just so that you can mess around without um, messing anything up in your student facing classroom. So go ahead and choose create class. Um, you name your class, we'll call this test today. Um, the section and the subject are not required, but they do show up on the card. So if you're teaching multiple sections of grade eight math, it is a good idea to put the section letter or number there. So then you'll be able to know just from looking on your cards on the classroom homepage, who who's you, who you're looking at? Yes, um, student. Excuse me, I have a froggy voice today. Um, there's also a subject in the room, and those show up on the cards as well. You don't have to add all your info there. And then you choose create. And once you press create, it has a little bit of magic to do, so it does take some time. Um, but then you get into your fancy brand new classroom um so i i'm just gonna do this i don't know why i didn't do this in the first place rookie move okay now it's your turn to try it out um please give me a thumbs up google meet has these fun like reactions so you can send a fun reaction just by clicking um the emojis in the bottom kind of underneath of me 
Uh, or you can send a thumbs up in the chat that you're ready to go. Justine found the cool thumbs up. Awesome. If you're ready to move on to the next one where we do a little tour of classroom. Oh, the hand like raises your hand. And then the on the other side of the share button, there's a happy face. If you click that, it lets you choose the emojis. Perfect. Yay, we all found the emojis. <laughs> if you if there's something today that you're like, oh, you answered my question, I'd love you to send an emoji. Because then I know like what are people looking for when we're talking about like diving into classroom for the first time. Um, okay, I think we got most everybody, Justine. Do you think we're ready to? move on i believe so perfect perfect and again also if you have any questions by all means put them in the chats mm -hmm. but i think we're good to, to go let's see awesome and justine if you notice i'm missing something please hop in you're more than welcome to hop in. no worries <laughs> okay all right so um let's do a little tour of what that top bar of classroom actually looks like. And this maybe will challenge some of the ways you use classroom already. Um, but I would just encourage you to think about, you know, maybe I could, maybe I could share something in the chat of like, oh, I actually use this differently. Or maybe there's ways that I could change up the way I'm using it to make it a little bit more streamlined for my students. Um, so uh, I have this like metaphor in my brain and you'll have to tell me if it makes sense because i really think that google classroom is like our physical classrooms i've been using classroom since it came out um so i really have been working hard to make sure that it fits seamlessly into my physical space as well as my digital space so my metaphor goes like such my stream is what i consider my bulletin board or perhaps the announcements over the loudspeaker. I do not put anything learning related there unless it's celebrations of learning. Um, the, um, the stream is like welcomes, announcements, those culture building things um, that are important to um, the classroom but are not important to teaching and learning. And Ray, I will share my slides for sure. I think Justine has the bit link too. <clears throat> you should always frantically take notes when I'm speaking, but that's for other reasons. <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> okay, uh, the classwork tab is like our binders, our students' binders. I also think of them as my plan book um, that has all of my sort of day-to-day -day stuff written down in it um, because I do a lot of my pre-planning in classroom by shaving drafts and I'll show you how that works. So classwork is where my students go to engage in learning. Um, that is the like number one place for them to belong. So that's their desk, that's the binder, that's that business. Um, the people page is that page in your plan book that has um, your student lists, or it's just the kids in front of you and just their digital avatars. So the people page is where you can find your class list, it's where you can add students, uh, or where you can mute students also. Um, and then we also have the grades page. Um, we're not going to talk about grades in this session. It's just a little bit outside the scope unless we get there really quickly um, because all of us are professionals. Um, but the grades page is where we accumulate all of our feedback and all of our assessments for the students. Does anybody have any questions like this? Um, what does the metaphor feel like to you? Does it align with the way you've been using it? Let, let us know in the chat, send a little emoji, whatever you think. Perfect. Thanks, Emma Hanley. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jennifer. All right. <clears throat> so this is one of those things um, that isn't um, intuitive to new uses of classroom. And I think something that's helpful to people um, who are just getting started and are kind of having some pain points, because there are some important settings to change that um, will really impact the way you use classroom with your students. So to get there, um, there's a, a gear up here. Um, and all you have to do to get kind of under the hood of your individual classroom is to choose that settings button. And there is where you can change all the details that you just set up. So you're really not married to any of the, the descriptions or sections, you can change that up as you need. Um, but these general, um, 
settings are important. Um, invite codes um, is this code that I can send to students or this link that I can send to students. And I only had this on for the first two days of my classroom because once all of my students were in, I didn't need that on all the time. So I would just turn it off. And then that way I know that nobody else is getting into the classroom unless I personally at them. So then I don't really have to worry about managing um, uh, the ins and outs of people, maybe adding the wrong class, all of that stuff there. So if I turn that off and then choose the save button, oh, I think it's accident. You'll notice that there's no class code here anymore so that I can't, they can't add students anymore. And that's just that simple toggle right here. If I turn it back on, there is a class code again. So that's one of those admin things that you really only need for the first couple of days of school. And I always turn it off. Um, the stream, um, streams are important. The stream is that first page, that bulletin page. And I always set mine, even when I was teaching high school, the students can only comment because I'm thinking of this classroom as my digital classroom space. And I don't want my classroom to turn into a, a forum, a free forum where students can talk about just anything. Uh, they have lots of other spaces to do that in. We have a Google chat going, we have um, a Google space going for my classroom. There were other places to have those more conversational aspects happening. Um, why, so I said students can only comment. Now that's not to say that I was like, the <laughs> lording over this and saying like, you know, you may not engage in this as a person. Lots of times I would post on my stream things like, like, what did you do this weekend? How did all the sports go this weekend? Tell me how um, your birthday celebration went this weekend. So then my students could add comments to my questions, but it wasn't sort of a, a free for all where I had to monitor what students were posting. It just sort of saved time for me um, to manage. So there's also the options that only teachers can post or comment, which means that students are not leaving any marks on the stream at all. Um, marks is maybe a misleading word. Students aren't leaving anything on the stream at all. So you can choose which one makes the most sense to you. I always choose, chose students can only comment. Um, classwork on the stream. This is my most um, controversial opinion. <laughs> I never showed notifications of the classwork on the stream because I did not want students to not go to the classwork tab and I'll show you what that looks like soon. I always wanted students to be able to go to the classwork tab because I did a lot of important organization on the classwork tab for them to see. And if they were only accessing assignments from the stream saying Miss A posted a new journal prompt, then they weren't seeing all of the rest of their work. It was like they were only looking at the first page of the workbook um, rather than seeing the whole structure of what we were doing. So I always chose hide notifications. Um, I just have show deleted items turned off because I'm the only one posting on the stream. I don't need to see what I deleted. Now, Will, I'm curious if you have Guardian Summaries enabled in your... That is you? currently, it's allowed. It's up to the individual teachers to, it, mm -hmm. they come on by default, but teachers do have the ability to turn them off. Okay. okay. Guardian summaries are, um, once a student's um, guardians are set up in Google, it, they live with them for almost ever. It takes an admin to take the guardian off. Um, and what it is, is a summary of what happened in the class that week. Um, I didn't have the best experience with guardian summaries, and I'll tell you why. Lots of times I would forget to return an assignment or I wouldn't get to an assignment or a student wouldn't turn an assignment in and it would show up as missing work. And then on the Friday afternoon when the Guardian Summary went out, I would get a whole bunch of frantic emails from really engaged and wonderful parents saying, what do I need to do? What does my student need to do? When in actuality, the student was really like, doing fine. All of their work was there. I could see all of their work. So I found that um, my parents were really concerned with the getting the work done piece and they weren't as engaged in the like, oh, this is what they're doing in the class. Um, does that track with your experience, Justine, for Guardian Summaries? Yeah, and I think, and I think sometimes, like Bailey said, like 
as a teacher, sometimes we um, don't mark as fast as we want, or so as some of our parents who are great or are on top of things, it's nice to keep us accountable, but also I think the stress comes on us of, oh, we need to get this done. Um, so it really depended on the grade I was teaching. Sometimes it's just nice for parents to get something rather than nothing for sure, but maybe kind of giving them a guideline of like what this actually means because it is obviously generated, right? It's not personal to maybe necessarily, as you can see on Bailey's screen, exactly. Like I kind of like that part, like what the worksheet is. It kind of gives examples when you put the description in the assignment of what we're doing, making parents aware of that part and maybe not necessarily focus too much about your child hasn't submitted this more yeah. of a, a guideline of where we are going with our work yeah totally and i like that was the thing that i found like you can't choose they're automated so you don't choose what goes into the summary um so lots of times i would post like a weekly announcement like hey parents we're working on our novel study this week because they're super engaged talking about i don't know i always did the outsiders with my grade eights um <laughs> super engaged talking about class differences you know we're, we're really digging into a lot of this stuff but they would be more concerned with the assignment rather than the what i wanted them to see which was the statement of learning so um that's 100 percent your call but i always toggled them off so that they weren't i didn't always after a few years i started toggling them off and just going back to my normal um sending an email to parents um or they, even um Bailey, sorry, someone wrote, Chris yeah. wrote, parents also seem to think Google Classroom is for them to log in and check things like a school website. And I often have to reiterate, it's just a conduit for students. I encourage students to log in and share things with parents, but this seems to be a mm. common sore point. And I was actually just as you were about, just before you posted that, Chris, I was gonna say as well, um, maybe good practice. What I've done is kind of like what Bailey said, I would actually post a summary on the stream and tell kids and tell parents parents actually go on your students account and see what's posted there and kind of see it on their end because like we mm -hmm. said the the summaries are very much auto-generated whereas for us i feel as teachers is getting those parents to have those conversations with students and seeing it from that end rather than just kind of an assumption from that summary of what's going oh, on yeah that's a good point thanks justine and thanks chris for sharing that pain point it's um a common one and it's tricky because really classroom is so student forward that when we bring parents in they kind of have a hard time seeing that oh no this is like their binder you'd never want to dig into a grade eight binder because there's weird papers everywhere <laughs> it's a little bit hard to follow if you weren't sitting next to the child um but it is an important look into their learning just not necessarily really parent friendly because it's not intended to be facing 100% of the time, right? Yeah, okay, great, thanks for that good conversation there. Oh, you you absolutely will find a weak old banana in there. It's <laughs> not good. Um, so I just realized that people in the recording can't see that. Lee said we might find a moldy sandwich. And true to the teenage experience, there's always something weird at the bottom of their lockers. <laughs> Okay, meet links, Google Classroom. For teachers like me, I taught in an online classroom. Google Classroom is tremendous at embedding that Google Meet um, link. But a lot of the times, like Anne-Marie, will absolutely not need her students to be able to join a Google Meet call. Um, so I would just toggle this um, off. I haven't even generated the meet link for this classroom, so it's not even an option. But if I were to generate a meet link, um, I can have it off and off, um, on and off. Google Classroom has done a lot of work in updating this recently. Um, we were having some themes in who could, who was actually the host of the um, Google Meet when it was created through Classroom. This is all kind of smooth sailing as far as I've experienced so far, whereas the teacher in the classroom is the only host. So for example, Will, Justine, and I are the hosts in this Google Meet right now. We can kick people out, we can mute people, none of you can. So it's the same side kind of setting in um, with this new Google Classroom Meet, and that's been fixed up a lot recently. Um, further down this kind of under the hood look is the 
grading, which we aren't getting into today, um, but there is some good stuff to dig into there. We choose save on those settings, and then we're kind of like ready, we're road ready. We passed our inspection and we're good to go to add students. So to add students, we're going to the people tab. There are two ways to add students and the easiest way for students in the slide deck, I say the savvy students, um, my older students were really okay with just going to classroom, choosing the plus button, join class, and then, um, um, adding the code like I showed you. So they would choose join class and then type in that code. Um, but our younger learners and maybe our learners who are newer to Google or newer to using tech in their in their learning are going to struggle with that. Um, and it's just one of those things that's really easy to work around by choosing this plus button on the people tab. So I've gone up and I've chosen people and I'm just going to add, oh, I'll add Holly here. And I'll add Ellen to this classroom. And then I choose invite. Now, what's going to happen is when they go to classroom.google.com, they're going to have a card for that class. I've been invited into this classroom right here, but I haven't accepted it because I wanted to show you what it looks like. Um, I can just accept and then I'm suddenly in the class. I didn't have to type in any codes. I didn't have to go to my email. All that happened was I went to classroom.google.com and then I could choose to accept that invitation. Um, so for those of you who are teaching younger learners, um, that adding is probably the best way to get students into classroom because then they just go to classroom.google.com, choose accept and they're in. Um, so that is that. Okay. I think we're going to skip this try it out because it's already 1030 and I want to get into like the posting stuff. So, um, oh, what about adding the parents? So Anne-Marie, that's a really good question and thank you for asking. That. <clears throat> um, you would, because you're the first teacher, you would be the person that um, adds the parents as their guardian. So when you have a student here, there's an invite guardians button. And that's where you can type in their email to so that they will get those guardian summaries. Now, I will, I really think, and um, I do send off, there's, you can always send feedback to Google by pushing this question button. I send this feedback often. <laughs> I think our guardian summaries need work. Um, I think for our youngest learners, the best thing to do is say we use Google Classroom for some of our work. You can check out what your students are doing by going to classroom.google.com and logging in as your student. Um, then they can see exactly all the work that's happening without that messy in between step of trying to translate what's actually happening. So just send the, them the like classroom.google.com and then I'd assume they already have their students login information um, so they'll be able to join class. Thanks for that good question. <clears throat> okay, the stream, um, like I mentioned before, the stream is kind of where I'd like to do that culture building stuff. That's right, Rebecca. So in that case, you would be sharing with the parents their students' email address. Um, if you go to the people tab and invite guardians, you can add any email address because it's just an email. So like I have styled parents with hotmail email addresses still where you can add them in. Okay. All right, the stream is where I do that culture building um, work with my students, where I ask them questions, um, where I give them an earworm. Um, so you'll see that there's lots of different options here. I can have YouTube videos. Um, I can have announce, I have pictures. My picture seems to have gone away, um, but adding a post to your stream is as simple as clicking that announce something to your class button, typing, and choosing post. But before you choose post, there's lots of options within Classroom to um, add things. So you can add a Google Drive file. Um, this might be like your syllabi, it might be your contact information, um, it might be um, like your contact card. There's lots of things you can add. You can add YouTube videos. 
Um, I like, there's a Vogue happy birthday video. I think it's already on this demo classroom um, that I like to, oh, I'll go Google search happy birthday languages. And you'll notice that I'm just searching Google from right within um, classroom, this one. Now, the whole thing is if I add this video in classroom and post it, the when we click on this, this is exactly what my students will see. When they click on this, there's no ads. There's no ads. There's no um, pop ups. Uh oh. No ads, no pop ups. Um, there's just the video. So this is a really great way to share videos with students, especially with younger students, because we're not getting that extra distraction of going to YouTube and getting all of the recommended videos or having that sidebar of like, hey, here's all these other videos you can watch. It's just that video in classroom. So we're really managing that executive function. We're really managing the focus um, and we're managing that digital citizenship and like safety piece of not having unknown ads popping up in the classroom. So this is super great way to share videos with students is just in classroom rather than sending them to YouTube to find a video. Um, the other things you can do is you can upload a file. So that's if you have a PDF or maybe you have a video file of your own if you'd like to add. You can also add links. And you can do add-ons. I'm not talking about add-ons in this session because Jen is talking about add-ons at the end of the day, and you're definitely going to want to check that out if you're interested. So that is announcements. Um, there are also shark teeth. Shark teeth are the pointy things um, that in Google Classroom signal to us there are things to see under here. So when you see a shark tooth, do not be afraid. Instead, you should click on it and be adventurous. Um, the shark tooth for when it where it says your classroom, if you choose that shark tooth, that means you can post to multiple classes. So maybe you're away that day and you want to say, hey, Ms. Thomas is in for me today. Please um, find your class assignments on the classwork tab and have a great day. And you don't have to post it six different times. You can just choose I'd like to go to these classes and then my post will go to all of the classes at once. Maybe you have a certain group of students going to volleyball provincials on um, Friday next week and you don't want all the students to see the homework they're getting or the announcement they're getting. So you could just choose which students to who will see the announcements. Um, that's that shark tooth there. And then this shark tooth that only shows up when you have something typed is to schedule or save a draft. Um, just a note on the scheduling. Um, Google Classroom does send notifications to student emails. Um, and my high school students had their phones on them at all times. And I was had to be really careful about when I was posting stuff. I was a, I'm a night owl, so I would do all of my planning late at night and um, would do all of my like classroom stuff late at night too. And that meant <laughs> that sometimes if I forgot to schedule a post to be at 8 a.m. or 8.30 a.m., then my students would see it. And sometimes I would have my, my Justines in there that were very keen. Sometimes those students would start doing their work or start working on the thing that I had told them to do before class had even started. Um, so I always, always schedule my posts to go live kind of at the beginning of class or at 8.30 in the morning, um, just to so that everybody's getting that like, fresh start of the day kind of thing. And also kind of <laughs> on like the positive side of that was that it um, prevented students from thinking that I was up all night and able to answer Google Chats and emails on their late homework because I can pretend that I, I work early in the morning, not late at night. Um, so that's the announcement thing. Um, I have talked for too much, so I think I'm going to give you a chance to try out making an announcement post. Um, and think about your classroom culture. Are you like a music person? Do you like talking about old music, like um, Britney Spears with your students, Backstreet Boys? Um, do you like sharing like little historical tidbits? Do you have like that favorite website you go to often? Those cultural things can really um, add to your Google Classroom by making it sort of feel like an extension of your personal classroom, your physical classroom online. So go ahead and give it a try. Give us a thumbs up in 
the meat when you're ready. If you want to experiment adding a YouTube video and then seeing that you can't see the um, ads, go ahead and try that. And we'll move on in like a minute or two here. I was going to say, Bailey, I also love for the students um, when I have to, especially more for my older students, when there's like some missing assignments or something a bit more personal. And obviously, I don't want to just, you know, when the actual classroom, you put that late work and you write all their names down, but it's kind of here where it's sort of like these two students or even a one, one student, just letting them know, you know, it's sometimes hard to have those one on one conversations in class when they're just running out the door to the next class or whatever, may, depending on what grade you're doing. Um, or if they're away for a really long time, it's a great way to kind of have those conversations. That's a really great point, Justine. And I think we're finding more and more in our work in our division that having um, a conversation in person and then followed up by a virtual, like e whether it's an email or a post on Classroom, are what's really getting a lot of positive feedback from us because we know our parents are seeing um, getting positive feedback for us because we know our parents are seeing the classrooms and and seeing that you know this is something that we've discussed with the student and we're following up on it. Yeah. All right, when you're ready, go ahead and give me an emoji and um, the meat and we'll move on when we see three or four or five emojis. Perfect. Excellent. Thanks so much. Perfect. Okay. Now, um, Paul, we're all excellent superstar teachers. How did you make those thumbs explode like that? That was exciting. <laughs> Thumb firework. <laughs> um, there's enough of the same one, it explodes. Oh, I didn't know that. That's fun. Yeah. Okay. No experiment to try. Okay. Um, we're all excellent superstar teachers, which means that we have a plan before we even begin. Um, and I think it's really important to think about our organization in classroom. So I've given a few examples of how you might organize your classroom and we are simply just using topics to keep it organized. Um, somebody like Emery, who is teaching grade one, she has her kids all day long. She might have topics that are mathematics, um, French language arts, English language arts, art, um, or, Maybe she'll have like work on today and then everything else is sort of like organized for herself underneath of that. Um, I was a high school English teacher and my Hamlet topic. I had my grammar and mechanics topic. I had my death of a salesman topic um, so that my kids could see the flow of work that was happening under each of our topics. Um, if you are uh, a more like logical timeline oriented person maybe you have daily topics that each daily work gets posted on there there's lots of different options um, and i would really encourage you to to check out the topics and use them to your benefit because when we get a classroom um, that has um, a classwork tab that has just Oh, I used to have this. This used to be very messy, but it's clean. I cleaned it up a while ago. When it has just lists and lists and lists of classroom assignments, that becomes useless for everybody um, because it becomes a long slog to try to find that specific assignment, right? So if we use topics, um, we can keep it a little bit more organized. Topics are really easy. All you do is choose create and topic. And then I always, always had my for today topic um added there you might be able to see here i always like to add emojis um oh i'm not on my oh there we go emoji is oh you can't see it i would just go let's target emoji i would google it and i would literally just copy and paste from emojipedia <laughs> is the easiest way to do that and i would paste it into um my topic and then when you have your topic in classroom, it has a little bit of a visual cue to it. Some teachers have like, um, are way more organized than me and they have uh, like a kind of logical order of what, what emojis they use. So a test or a quiz might have like a 100 
emoji with it, something that um, the students needed to write on, maybe had a pen. So they had a little bit of an organizational structure that their kids could see, their students could see um, what um, the work was just based on the emoji that was being used. Um, so again, to add that emoji, all I did was I Googled um, star emoji and copied the emoji from Emojipedia. It's so silly and simple. And then I chose create, copy, it, and I pasted it in there. Pasted it in. And that's how you make a pretty topic. There is an extension as well, Rebecca say, for Chrome. And depending on your computer, you might be able to do a right click and then it shows up as emojis, but it just depends on the computer that you are on. Yeah. I when I was demoing, I noticed that you couldn't see my um yeah, my right click menu. So I just showed you how to copy paste. Yeah, there is a yeah. right click. Yep, there's emoji keyboard. There's so many different ones. And it depends too, because even when I do my right click and I do my emoji and symbols, it doesn't have everything. Mm -hmm. Whereas Emojipedia has exactly. pretty much everything. Yeah. Okay, let's take a 30 second break here and add a topic. And if you're super user, I forget who our fighter jet or fighter jet pilot was, Rebecca and Lee. <laughs> um, try to add some emojis. Maybe you're like thinking about your own classroom now wondering if there's an organization structure that you might use. Well, um, we'll give you a minute, 30 seconds to finish that. Come on back to the meet when you have that posted and we'll move on to assignments next. And um, once you get that topic finished up, come on back and give me a thumbs up or a heart or a celebration. I'm curious, let me know in the chat if you um, have been using topics, what your strategy for topics is. If you're a date person, if you're a topics person, if you're a subjects person, um, or if you might fold them into your work. Your students are going to come back on Thursday to a rejuvenated classroom full of emojis and fun stuff. <laughs> I'm curious to hear. And emojis are, are great, not even just like they're visually appealing, but even for students who maybe the younger students who can't read yet, like look for the book one, that's our English work, or look for the number, mm -hmm. that's our math work, or even using the numbers, right, as organizational we're doing this first, second, third. Yeah, the emojis yeah. I find really help for those kids. Perfect. That's great. Thank you for adding that, Justine. It's helpful. All right. I think we're ready to move on to adding assignments now. Um, so I was talking a lot with some of teachers I support about why we're using Classroom um, to share assignments. and kind of narrowed it down to these three things. So first of all, because we need to spend more time on what counts. And I was working with a lot of teachers who were doing a lot of admin work on chasing down digital recruit students without realizing that Classroom kind of did all of the good stuff for them. It compiled it all in one place. It made it um, really streamlined for marking. It was really putting the focus on the students and their learning. Um, the second thing when I thought about was because our students really need to practice working in the digital sphere. Um, a lot of them are going to be working in 100% digital environments um, and they need to have a workflow learned um, that allows them to be 
um, efficient and productive and creative um, in a digital working environment. And because it is an all in one spot, I was working with a teacher recently that was using Canvas for one thing and Google Docs for another thing and um, was really relying on Google Spaces. And it became hard to manage um, because there was just too many spots for students to find work. So we compiled it all into one so that everything digital starts from classrooms. So students know they have to have classroom open to get started in um, classroom, to get started in their learning. Um, so that create button, like you saw when you chose topic, that create button is where you add work. And there are some options there. Um, and I relied on like the school metaphor again <laughs> to help us keep this straight because this is an important distinction. And some of you might find that you use one um, type of assignment more than the other. Uh, but we uh, think about the assignment like uh, a photocopier. It distributes files to the students. Um, it makes a copy for each student or it's the same copy for each student. You know, there's lots of different options there and we'll get more into that. But that assignment, create assignment button is our photocopier. The quiz assignment, I like to think of it as a Scantron. What that does is it creates a Google form and inputs the marks into Classroom. So um, it can self-correct um, assignments and pull the marks right into Classroom so that you're not spent spending a ton of time assessing simple quizzes. Uh, that question button is like the old school clickers some of us had when we were in university, where you had the four buttons and you had to choose the one and it was like cutting edge technology. Um, I love questions for those quick answers for students. I always, always posted one as a bell ringer when I was teaching and when I had my online classes. Um, that was always my, my daily reflection, my daily bell ringer, my daily reading comprehension from the homework or from yesterday's reading was just a question because students could type and it was done. It wasn't an extra document. It was all living right in classroom. Um, the material we think of as a textbook or a library shelf. We post things that students need to see, but not necessarily interact with. So that's like their syllabi, their schedules, maybe the um, cafeteria menu for the week, those sorts of things. Um, reuse post is you know how we all have those binders of like, <laughs> this was my class for the last three years. The reuse post is essentially that, um, where you can go back into previous Google Classrooms and reuse posts that you've used in previous years. So it's pretty handy that way. All right, so I'll go back into my classroom and I'm going to create an assignment. So I just choose create assignment. Um, I believe my example, I just have to click on drive and see my recent files. Uh, yeah, my example was this character sketch. So I'm going to, actually let's do the magazine, Alberta's History Magazine. All right, in my instructions, I know that it's an important UDL um, strategy to have my instructions written and verbal. Lots of different ways to access instructions. If I had more time, I would demo that for you, but I don't. So I'm just going to go down to these buttons here. You can add anything to the assignments. Um, I always use Google Drive files. And I'm just going to go ahead um, and choose, let's choose this grand piece. Grand, La Grand Pie de Montreal here. Um, it's an image analysis. It's a Google Slides file. Now, a new shark tooth pulled up once I added that Google Drive. And I'm just going to show you again. When I click that attach button, I was in my recent Google Drive files, but I can search anything. Um, but, um, I could search anything in my Google Drive and it would come up. There's all of my plot diagram in my Google Drive. This button is like the pure magic of Classroom because what Classroom actually is is sort of a student cover over Google Drive. All of the stuff that we're creating lives in Google Drive and we're just sort of making it easy on, our, on ourselves to make files. So these three buttons are key and I do have them on um, my slides just for you to go back to if you want to take another peek. Students can view file means that all the students see the same file. Students can edit file means all students can edit the same file. 
So sometimes that's like the wild, wild west, but it is helpful in some situations. I did a lot of my peer feedback with a students can edit file um, because it was all kind of compiled in one place. Students were working on the same document and they could see all of the work happening at once. If you're doing brainstorming, if you're doing idea generation, if you're doing like a community revision exercise, that kind of file is important. It requires a lot of support, especially for our younger students in what appropriate behavior is, but I trust you, you're the professionals. <laughs> Make a copy for each student, that's the one where Every student gets their own copy that's identical to the one that you created, and they make their edits and, own, and they can see it and you can see it. So it's sort of like handing out an individual copy for each student. Over here, we have a ton of shark teeth again. You can post to multiple classes. So if you have multiple sections of the same class, you can post to multiples. You can choose which students. So if you're differentiating or if you're creating small groups, you can choose which students have access to which assignment. <laughs> um, if you choose a due date, you can do so here. It, the default is no due date. Um, for my older students, I always had, you know, my, well, they did Tuesday morning was the due date on this assignment. And it also shows up in their Google Classroom. So there is a lot of um, work workflows in here for students. Um, and then this button, close submissions after due date. There's this little I button here. That means that students can't add new attachments onto their work after the due date. I never checked this because it ended up just being a ton of extra work for me because I would have an assignment closed down and then I would have to go back and open it. Uh, there's also topics so you can stay um, super organized by choosing topic and then the grading. Um, I hope you're noticing that really for the most part this is quite straightforward and intuitive. If you want to add a drive file, you choose the drive button. This one I find this this shark tooth right here is the one that is a little harder to wrap your head around if you're new to classroom. But once you get the, the gist of the three, um, you're there. So when I choose the assign button, Google in the background is making a copy in each of the drive file folders in my students' class, in my students' drives for that work that I just assigned to them. And here it is right here. I'm just going to click and drag because all of everything on Google um, Classroom can be clicked and dragged into where you want it to be. I can drag it into this topic. And you can see <clears throat> when I click on it, uh oh, need to refresh my page. It's unhappy. When I click on it, I've assigned it to my two students that are in this classroom. This is my copy. And I can see my students' copies by clicking on view student work. All right. Um, I wish that we had a little bit more time, but we don't. So I am uh, going to show you this slide. This is what students see. This is more important for our older students. Um, they always have the option to add, and students can additional files to it. They can add screenshots, they can add photos. I always posted a daily journal assignment without any attachments because my expectation of my students remember my students were a ways away from me sometimes too my expectation of my students was you posted your daily writing and they would just add a picture from their phone i was lucky that they all had phones um, and then i could see their writing they didn't do a ton of assessing on it because it was a picture but um, that was there they also have the option to run originality reports jen will be talking about originality reports um, this afternoon they choose if they choose the hand in button um their cloud their to-do list which lives kind of here um where is it their to-do list which is right here um will be that, that assignment will be removed and then you can also add private comments. The students can add a private comment. I did a lot of reflective work with my students with that private comment button. What is something that you might change about your process here? What's your favorite thing that you want me to notice about your work here? That kind of work lived there. Then <clears throat> once that work was finished, I'll show you what it looks like um, from my end. Once I click on that assignment and choose view instructions, I can see all of my students work. And now if I click on Kendall didn't attach it because he's a bad student, but if I clicked on um, my student Bailey here, 
I can see these um, this feedback that I built for Bailey living right in the assignment. And how I got there, because this one is a little bit unintuitive as well, is I click on the assignment, I click on view instructions, and then I choose student work. And then when I click on my student's name, I can see all of the private comments. So lots of times I would have comment chains going with my students. Now, the magical thing and the best thing about Google Classroom that I spend every day, all day on as a high school English teacher is the assessment screen. If that's not its official name, but it's what I called it. Um, you can see it here on this, how to get to it on this slide, and then sort of a rundown of what it looks like on this slide. But if I click on one of the attachments, it has to be a Google attachment. If I just click on it, it opens up a new tab. In this gray box, that is Google Slides. My students were working in Google Slides for this assignment. That's all of their work. If my student was working on this, assignment, I would see it in real time. But then this sort of L-shaped overlay is like the teacher's dream. I can choose any student um, or I can toggle between students. Um, I can leave comments right here that live in Google Classroom. So I can leave comments right as I'm watching. There's also that assessment piece, um, which Jen will show you later. Um, I can also return it back to them, which means that they get edit privileges again. Um, I can also change their work. If I wanted to, just zoom in here. If I wanted to suggest some writing, I could say Bailey is suggesting this, and I would write um, their work in Google Drive mode. If you're doing a Google Docs, right, you can also edit in suggesting mode, which means that you're not actually making changes, you're just making suggestions, um, which is a really great strategy to write beside students, rather than being that copy editor that sometimes we turn into when we're giving feedback on writing. Uh, okay, that was a really, really quick whirlwind tour of the, the assignments and the assessment um, pieces of classroom. I'm curious if you wouldn't mind reflecting for me in the chat or to yourself, what do you think and how can you see it folding into your work? Um, that is the end of our time. Thank you, Will, for having us. Um, Thanks, Will. I'm, I'm happy to 